Hello and welcome back to Smug and Play, YouTube's foremost authority on Win9X era PC gaming technology and culture. And today we're going to give you a little bit of edutainment uh, with a topic that Alan has selected that I think is ridiculous, but the algorithm doesn't care and we only have 34 subs. So who's really going to be upset? Tell us all about it. So I wanted to talk about uh, Intel processor history and somehow uh because Intel has very fancy code names for their processors, it brought me into natural history. Yes, um, naturally. Which is why we've pictured here some dinosaurs, some old processors um, who are who are drinking water at a, a lake. I think it's a canal, actually, but whatever. Yeah, it's probably a comet lake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe a coffee so, lake. Yeah, let's just get into it. Let's, we're talking about Intel x86 processors here. Um, named after the 8086, uh, and then they, you know, went up 286, 386, 486, and then at some point they decided to have uh, Names. nice trademarks, so they went to Pentium, Pentium 2, Pentium 3, Pentium 4, and then they threw out the whole Pentium thing, and it's just been core since then. But in addition to their sort of you know, external facing names, they also had internal code names for these processors. Right. And, uh, you know, up through the Pentium, it was just sort of numbers, letters, P5, whatever. Um, but things got interesting with Pentium 2. We got rivers. Yes. And we continued doing some rivers. Uh, and then eventually they added lakes and random towns. Uh, but I was always very interested in what are these rivers? And, and <laughs> I did some more research. And I actually think I learned more about the processors themselves by sort of understanding the code name. So that's what we're going to kind of dive into starting with the Pentium 2 yeah. here. So, so gather your children around because we're not only going to learn about Intel's uh, sort of interesting architectures from the, the late 90s and early aughts, but also some of America's uh, sort of natural beauty uh, and... Uh, and uh, preserved wilderness areas. Um, so you want to dive right in with uh, 1997's Klamath? The Klamath. I'll tell you about the processor first. So okay. The processor is the consumer version of this fancy processor they made uh, called the Pentium Pro. Uh, and what the, this was about was these CPUs had all this hardware. You know, they have multiple integer execution units. They have like a floating point unit. And wouldn't it be nice if we can get them all to run, you know, simultaneously so that we can get more stuff done, more throughput, just, you know, That's push right. those operations through. That's right. Um, yeah. And so this was a this was a big improvement and did all sorts of fancy things with fancy terms like out of order execution, register renaming, great things that made the processor faster might have introduced some security vulnerabilities, yeah. but we didn't find out about and, that for 20 and, years. And so. notably, faster, uh, even with code that's not specifically optimized for the processor. For, so right. for existing binaries, this is faster. It was a big improvement over the, the Pentium Pro, which had uh, excellent 32-bit performance. However, when you were then to uh, run sort of legacy 16-bit code, it actually was it was slower um, than the regular Pentium. This was considered sort of fine, you know, in the 32-bit pure like Windows NT space for like high-end computing. But you got to remember that you know Microsoft's consumer operating systems like Windows 95 still carried a lot of 16-bit legacy code in them, and so there'd be a considerable performance hit actually with some of those things on Pentium Pro. The Pentium two basically took all the good stuff in Pentium Pro and then uh, gave us good 16-bit sort of legacy code performance as well for an all-around consumer product. And it was uh, it was pricey, as you know. Yeah. Um, because of what that, a lot of what a lot of people know about is that they put these on cards so that yeah. they could have cash chips bundled with the CPU on sort of its own like board. Um, but that increased the, the price a lot. And, uh, and uh, there's a video from Phil about how the, the 300 megahertz version, yeah. the top end one, cost $1981. In, in 1997, in 1997 so it cost basically $2,000. Like, it cost $2,000. Bucks right, which is quite pricey. I mean, so the, the reason why it's on that card, this was an important sort of overall computer architectural improvement in that in the Socket 7 era with the original Pentium and Pentium MMX, 
um, the, the L2 cache actually lived on the motherboard because it was connected not to, directly to the processor, but rather to the north bridge. So uh, if the CPU made a, a memory request, the north bridge could either pull it out of L2 cache that was soldered on the board or it could pull it from RAM. This allowed uh, the L2 cache to be proximate to the processor faster uh, and, and change who's managing um, you know, what happens when there's a cache miss. So um, it was, a, it was a, a big sort of architectural improvement, um, but you know, it resulted in these interesting, chunky uh, looking cards that um, I'm very nostalgic for now, but um, would yeah. basically go the way of RDRAM. <laughs> Um, so the river, uh, tell me about the river. It's a big, it's a pretty big river um, going from that. southern Oregon and dumping out into the Pacific Ocean in uh, California. It's got uh, coho salmon, it's got chinook salmon, we nice. got trout, we got we oh. got nice things. Um, but I see a similarity here in that sort of the damming of the Klamath has led to higher water temperatures and uh, higher mineral content that have made it worse for salmon and. The way I relate this to the Klamath, the Klamath had these huge yield problems. Oh, uh, it was hot. I don't. I and and they just they couldn't make enough of them, so it was very expensive. Uh, and I, I somehow see a, a a synergy here between these these two problems. Um, I've decided though, and so we're gonna decide for each one which one's better, the river or the right. processor. I decided the processor is better just because. Um, the, the floating point performance of the Pentium 2 is much faster than anything else. And all these games, 3D games were coming out. We didn't really have hardware acceleration. No, so... we would not have hardware transform and lighting until the GeForce yeah. 256. So the uh, Pentium 2 was a, was a big stellar performer on uh, games. And yeah. so I like the River too, but you know. I think we used a Klamath once, a 266. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and I was not blown away by the performance uh, relative to the Pentium MMX, the P55, um, at you know at 200 to 233. Um, although, so are you yeah. going river? Is that, is that I? You know what? I like I like when you told me about the salmon and the rainbow trout. I got some good memories of a fly fishing trip. You know. <laughs> And so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go river on this, um, even though the floating point performance is there. So I think we're we have a split decision. We should move on. That's all right. All right, the shoots. The shoots. So uh, Intel, until recently, had this TikTok model where they would make. A... <laughs> now we should be clear. This isn't the one with the short form videos that kids are into these Sorry. days. This is not. This was a, this was a transition back and forth between architectural and process improvements yeah, that Intel sorry. carried out that allowed them to dominate or supposedly dominate the semiconductor space for uh, many stretches of of years uh, between the the nineties and the current present. Yeah. Day. So so this one is is a better process and so it's cooler. They had better yields. They could sell them yeah. for cheaper. Uh, they also raised the the front side bus to one hundred megahertz. But you know this isn't a huge leap sort of architecturally over um, over Klamath. Um, the Chutes River, uh, this one's really known for its fly fishing. So, mm. uh, and it also has salmon. But look, uh, we're way down on discharge. We're only, you know, 50, about 5,300 cubic feet. And it's a long river. Um, it's a smaller river. But to me, it's it's the namesakes of a very good brewery. Yeah, the Deschutes nice Brewery, IPA. right. Um, so I'm going to give it to the shoots just just for the beer. Well, I mean, so notably, the Deschutes Pentium 2 also scaled all the way up to 450 megahertz, yeah. which was, you know, it was impressive uh, at the time. Uh, and the, the thermals were more manageable. Yield issues, I think, had, had improved. And so, um, you know, you were more likely to, to have one of these. And uh, it was it was paired with one of the, you know, graphics chips from the day or paired with an SLI Voodoo 2 setup. Um, you know, this was a, a potent processor for gaming. Um, but I mean, would I, would I take that over to Deschutes Brewery at this point? I think I would rather have a six pack of something from Deschutes Brewery than I would a Pentium 2 Deschutes. 
Um, but I, I did love my Deschutes. Uh, I have really good memories out of Micron system with a 450 megahertz Deschutes. And so, I don't know, it, it's, I'm split on this. I could go either way. They're, they're both great. So indecisive. I'm uh, sorry. Can we move all right, on? Let's, let's mix it up. We have, we have now a so county. This is so, not I mean, a this river. Is, this is a Celeron. So I, I mostly just wanted to inform people about the history. So Celeron is, is Intel's uh, budget offering. Right. Uh, and they didn't want to sell these expensive cards with cash chips and all that stuff. So they figured a way to, to shrink that cash onto the die and make this uh, processor on like a plastic package so they could sell it out cheaply um, and kind of make a new market segment for, for um, computing. Um, but it was also a very good performer and you could overclock it uh, often, you know, like a 50% overclock. Mm -hmm. And then you would get something that's faster than the Deschutes for cheaper. Intel, I think, you know, they, they didn't know this was they should have foreseen it, but they they uh, they didn't know that this would be the well, outcome. Well, you know, I think based on based on you know your video and you know a video that I'm going to do about uh, a Celeron Mendocino build, it, the the legend is a little bit greater than the reality. So the Celeron 300A, the lowest clock Mendocino, uh, Mendocino has a multiplier that's low enough that if you push up, because it was multiplier locked, but if you push up the FSB from 66 to 100, like you could, it would still, you had a good chance of it running, but the the processor sort of topped out at what, maybe a little over 500 on good samples, but not every sample was good. And so if you, if you didn't make it all the way to 100, you were at some weird PCI and weird AGP frequency, which could lead to other stability issues. So it was basically, you're, you're rolling the dice. You had to get a low-end one, and then you rolled the dice that you could get it up to 500 or so. And, and if you, at 100 megahertz FSB, and if you could do that, then, you know, everything, I think, so wait, I, I'm not doing my math right. The 300A, 100 FSB. It goes to 450. It goes to 450. Yeah. The 333 goes to 500 goes to 500 so those are basically the two you'd be looking at any other it's not worth in my mind overclocking any other seller on mendocino but it, you're not necessarily going to make it there and if you make it to like 83 or something like that you could have all sorts of problems so and not to mention that the motherboards of the time did not necessarily have the most stable high quality vrms because the socket 370 ppga boards were typically budget options and i think you're going into a lot of detail i'm going into a lot of detail to the mendocino I, county Okay, let's talk uh, about Mendocino which, County. Now, this is some interesting facts through. here. I don't know, were these, was the second fact here true in 1998? Oh, definitely so. Oh, okay. I mean, so, I mean, they grow marijuana there. That's all I've featured here. So here's my, the question. I, why it, this, why this, is this the Celeron? image I have is uh, some, like, illegal pot farming operation that got shut down. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought those were the resistors on the underside of the of the pen package. No, okay, no. that's a pawn operation. Uh, okay, well, if that's a pawn operation, but I can see why I it got shut down because it's very to, large. I think what this speaks to is Intel wanted to make a kind of slow processor. You know, uh, you know, being it's like a more high region than the slow. So here's my question for you, Alan. Why is it socket 370 and not socket 420 then? Because that's a real missed opportunity. Well, Elon now, Musk wasn't working there. The now, time, Willamette, so. I think, is socket 423, right? Anyway. Off I, by three. You could clip off three pins. I, I think we're going to agree the processor is clearly better. Or it, it exceeded the, the expectations of, of the slowness. It exceeded the expectations. It's much, much faster than it has any right to be. I mean... That one year in 1998, it was the zero to hero build option um, for a lot of things, for workstation builds as well as for gaming builds. Uh, and and that was a bit at the height of their power slash notoriety, making boards that made Intel chips do things they weren't supposed to do. And I think for the historical reasons, the, the seller on Mendocino gets the vote for me. All right. <laughs> Okay, so now Ooh. to the to the the Pentium exclamation mark exclamation mark mm. exclamation mark. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> or I That's aye. what the algorithm thinks it is. Uh, this is also not a river, but there are many rivers, I'm sure. There are, in there are rivers. Park. 
yeah, that cut through Katmai yeah. National Park. So this processor, let me tell you tell a little me all bit about it. it. Um, so Intel knew that AMD was releasing a new processor in 1999, um, which would come out a few months after Katmai. Uh, called Athlon, and I think they knew that it was going to be fast. In fact, it was faster on both integer and floating point performance when it came out mm -hmm. than this Katmai. So Intel decided to change the rules of the game, right? They're like, okay, we can't beat them on raw performance. What if we create new instructions that will let you do things yes. faster? Right. Uh, and so if people then, you know, compile their their programs against this new instruction set right. will actually come out on top, which is pretty smart. Um, it's smart if you are in a dominant market position and you also are the creators of the Intel optimizing compiler and yeah. a lot of other factors here. But so I, what you're talking about here is that the Katmai Pentium 3, the first Pentium 3, in addition to introducing some strong marketing, uh, introduced SSE. Uh, which yeah. is a SIMMED extension, uh, as you say, single structure, multiple data. Basically, it's a way of doing uh, the same mathematical operation on a number of values simultaneously. It has applications specifically, I mean, in um, video encoding and decoding, as well as in um, uh, 3D graphics yeah. uh, for geometry manipulation. So should be great for multimedia, right? Um, and it, and it is good. The thing is, this is kind of a stopgap processor in that they actually didn't really implement SSC, uh, I, I would say, correctly. They, oh. they cut some corners yeah. because they didn't have many transistors to play with. Yeah. Um, so it seems like they were trying to get something in to kind of counter AMD, but it's not right. like a super great processor. It was also really, really hot. Not quite as hot as that 300 megahertz Klimath, but... Um, uh, 35 watts, which now would be like a low low voltage. Yeah, processor I know 35 watts. That's like the bottom <laughs> end of the spectrum. I mean, I know. it's it's amazing how our expectations changed really with the Pentium 4 as to exactly what the the you know thermal design power of a CPU should be. Like, you know, with the old with the old stuff, like with the you know the Celeron, uh, you know Mendocino. Like, I think top end is like 25 watts or something like that like oh yeah and the pentium 3 would never reach 35 watts again i mean it came a little bit close but yeah and not but, not yeah, under the normal cool. circumstances but these things they did not require the you know elaborate cooling solutions that we would later see um with other intel processors i mean so now it should be noted that let's not give them too much credit for SSE because 3d now was also available on amd's k6 line if I'm correct, at this time, which also had some simmed elements to it, but I, I don't... well, so so the thing about 3D now is it was, it was a bit compromised. Um, yeah, well, you just said uh, that the SSC SSC, implementation is also SSC. Compromised. We're getting into way too okay, technical it's too detail, technical. but S but SSC had some changes that required all the operating systems to release patches, and I think AMD thought they couldn't do that, and so. 3D now is a bit compromised, but also just being the second player, it's right. like hard to. Yeah, I'm, it's I'm, hard I'm to recalling just... this now vaguely, but yeah. I'm not going to recall well but, enough to say anything. I mean, being the second it. player, it's hard to just say, "Oh, you're going to use these new instructions." Right. right? Like, although AMD 64 happens, but I mean, it takes it uh, takes uh, Intel really, you know, losing it for that to happen. I was going to say that in some ways, SSE is like the AVX 512 of 1999, right? Like, there's not a lot optimized for it, and you know, it, it by the end of this year, we're going to have hardware transform and lighting, which is going to offload a lot of these mathematical duties to the GPU. And so, I, I don't give them so much credit. I think I think you're hating a little bit too much on SSC. I think I think Microsoft, for example, is pretty fast releasing patches for both uh, 3D now and SSC for like uh, DirectX geometry. So I actually yeah, think sure. I mean, it, it I was it well it was well supported in in graphics drivers, for instance. I think very benefits quickly. came actually fairly fairly, fairly quickly. quickly. Sure, um, but, but let's talk about how beautiful yeah, Katmai. I mean, is. Katmai National Park is an incredible treasure. It is one of the best protected federal uh, sort of yeah. wildlife areas. It, it has. Um, I saw. I just saw a documentary about this, so I'm kind of fresh off of this. But you know, uh, brown bears in profusion um we got wolves 
Uh, it's really just incredible untouched wilderness with very dramatic uh, geographical features and geological features as well as um, sort of very dramatic changes between the seasons. Right. So um, this isn't even really a contest. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, exactly. It's not it's not the best. It's, it's to shoots with SSE versus one of the most gorgeous and dramatic landscapes on the planet. I think yeah. that my national park is is got to be it. Yeah. But All now, right. now it's a whole different story. But now, now it's later now that a, year, a very <laughs> it should be noted. Well I, process. Yeah. This was quite a year, nineteen ninety nine, right? Um, because in February, I believe the Cat My Pinium threes are introduced at four fifty and like five hundred megahertz, and then by December of ninety nine, we have a whole new sort of Pinium three um, that is it is nuzzling up against the gigahertz barrier although it won't cross that until the next year so tell us all about it. <laughs> you just give, you so, just sorry, give everything away so the copper mine uh this is uh finally we have a pentium with the cache on the die yeah uh and uh this is very very fast uh, full speed and uh they actually increased the uh the um the bus width to 256 bits, which AMD didn't have for a while. So Ooh, they had so a lot of bandwidth. They had, they had a lot nice. of speed coming from that cache. Uh, and then this was famous, as you kind of gave away, for hitting the gigahertz barrier and then breaking it slightly. <laughs> By 133 megahertz. The gigahertz barrier, like it's a it's real It's not thing. a real um, barrier, but I mean, I think it was a marketing and sort of emotional barrier um, <laughs> to finally go yeah. from... For having languished at three digits for the entire decade to finally get to four and stop and stop using the megahertz sort of uh, bar altogether, moving to this like new metric of gigahertz, um, I was I, I mean especially in this sort of very millennial year of you know nineteen ninety nine, uh, it was it was heady times. I mean yeah, so this was a very good performer. Um, Face stiff competition from AMD as well, but stands on its own as a great processor. Uh, the Coppermine River, this one is, while it's our longest river, um, it's very far north. It's probably like as far north as really human civilization really should go. Mm. So, you know, it freezes. I don't know how this relates to the processor. Maybe it's either they found a cache of copper at the Copper Mine River, so it's like cache, or it's a really cool <laughs> river, so the processor was cool. Um, it seems, anyway, it's yeah, a, it doesn't seem intentional. I don't really understand what the correlation here is, but I mean, this is the this is the Intel chip that crossed the gigahertz barrier, yeah. quote unquote. Um, it it. It finally, I mean, the cat mine couldn't really compete with Athlon. Copper mine competed much more successfully with Athlon and really wouldn't be overtaken till, you know, Athlon XP. I'm very nostalgic for it because it's from this era of 99 and I think also has some of the best games. You know, this is this is the thing that you would be playing Deus Ex on and Starcraft and Fallout 2 and uh, Diablo 2 and you know, Unreal Tournament, like this is, that's what you would have. Um, I'm going Copper Mine. What about you? I mean, River. Uh, no, not River. Oh, it's you. <laughs> the processor, the processor. processor. Yes. I okay. got confused. All right. Next one. Move on. This is, this is a, this is a big river coming up. Uh, oh, man. Oof, oof. It's a lot of discharge. Uh, the, the Will <laughs> Amnit. Can you yes. came out in 2000. Um, although it was, for most people, it was a curiosity because they didn't really get one of these uh, because uh, until 2002, early 2002, you had to have this expensive RAM called RD RAM right. to use a Pentium for, and it really just put this out of reach for most people. Um, but the Pentium 4, the main pur purpose of this was just gigahertz. How many gigahertz can we get? Uh, and they thought, okay, the more gigahertz we get, the more sales we get, everything's happy. Fantastic party on. Uh, um, and so they they did that uh, by messing with the pipeline to be able to kind of do that. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, 
the I mean the downside was that uh, the number of gigahertz doesn't really have anything to do with the performance of a processor necessarily. It depends on um, what you're doing during that time, and if all you're doing not, during that time is moving things from one register to another register in preparation for some execution stage, then you're not really doing more work. Um, I the thinking behind NetBurst is interesting, right? The idea is that we throw away efficiency, like per clock, for just raw throughput, hoping that the process improvements that Intel's been, you know, regularly making will allow us to clock this thing to the stratosphere so fast that those the fact that it's inefficient, you know, won't matter because you'll be running it so fast that it will just blow away everything in pure throughput. But the problem was that. Netverse just never ended up clocking up that fast because yeah. of the laws of physics um, that Intel right. slammed into. Hello, quantum mechanics right. suddenly became a real big deal. Um, but to be clear, the Willamette was more a curiosity. We didn't know then that it would all fall yeah, apart. I mean, and so as we go through this, I think it'll become more clear kind of what happens. Um, I do want to talk about the river. Uh, this sure. is the river that you know flows through Portland. And uh, a lot of Intel's development is in Hillsboro, Oregon, which is next to Portland. So this was a very big, important river. I mean, this is the highest discharge river we're going to talk about yeah. here. Uh, and it flows into the Columbia, which is another, you know, There's even more order magnitude. There's probably a lot of commercial fish. traffic on this river, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. and it supports 60 f fish species. So it, it's, it speaks to, one, the discharge here is indicative of this high throughput <laughs> sort of mindset mm -hmm. that Intel had, right? Right. Like how much just can we push through right. uh, uh, with with raw gigahertz? Um, and also, again, a very important river to these folks. Um, the processor does not live up to, to that. Uh, no, I mean, it's but, being a curiosity. As you said, it's, it's on the platform that requires RDRAM. It's extremely expensive and it's outperformed by the high-end Pentium 3s. Well, what well, you can show about this is the processor that I had a weak showing against, which is what it was, what, which was embarrassing, was the Tualatin um, yeah. Pentium 3. So uh, the return of the Pentium 3, it's funny that it's they back. had sort of two, two lines simultaneously uh, pushing out new processors. Right. Um, but this was a, uh, again, with the TikTok model, this was the, uh, the process improvement upon Pentium 3, uh, and it enabled more speed. So it went up to 1.4 gigahertz, uh, and there, you know, it performed well, even against like a two gigahertz Willamette. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it didn't really make us optimistic for the Pentium 4. But this was a really nice processor uh, that I'm sure, you know, yeah. well, there's so a million YouTube videos there are about, a million YouTube videos sort of about it. Yeah. I mean, so the so people who like us think that the area around the change of the millennium was sort of the most exciting in in pc gaming because there's so many gpu vendors and there's so many sort of games that spawned long franchises um you know they they worship the Twilatine because it's the best and fastest version of the Pentium 3 which is sort of the most nostalgic processor of that era but the thing is like the boards not every socket 370 board supports Twilatine um, and because collectors and enthusiasts are so into the Twalatine, it tends to be very expensive online. It is much cheaper to build a yeah. machine around a Pentium 4, um, which is less sexy. Um, I but do think if, you, if you watched YouTube exclusively, you would think that the Twalatin was like everybody had one. But right. it, it was only during a very sort of narrow period of time, and actually you tended to be low-end systems because... Again, yeah. Intel is pushing out Pentium 4 is the future. Right, RDRAM is the future. Twalatine um, was on the last so, generation sort yeah. of chipset. Um, yeah. So a lot of the Twalatines out there are actually Celerons. I mean, they're nice Celerons. They're clocked at like 1.2, 1.3, etc. Yeah. Um, uh, but that's it was actually in these Celeron low-end systems usually, it, 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 except in the server market where it was huge, of course. Yeah, um, this is what would be in a you know a, a rack mounted server of that era, yeah. and that's what the S is for. <laughs> yeah. So the river tells you a little bit about what they were thinking here. So this river flows into the Willamette. So it's it's subordinate to the Willamette in mm -hmm. their 
uh, mindset, which uh-huh. is what, which is ironic, right? Because the Tualatin was faster. So right. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I I don't venerate the processor as much, um, but you know, I think I think the Tualatin River Shed is very important to a lot of people, whereas the Tualatin is really more important to YouTubers. Um, I think more people depend on its watershed, so I'm gonna go river. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go river as well. Okay. We're going to get a lot of yeah. down votes for this, but we're, we're going river. Sorry, Tualatin lovers. Um, yeah. So, so <laughs> now you have, a, you have sort of an all points bulletin here. Um, we, have I, a, we have a missing I, child. Um, and... I, so, the, the next Pinium Forge came out in 2002 is, is the Northwood, and this is a really nice processor. Uh, and uh, got us quickly to three gigahertz and a little bit beyond that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really put AMD to shame at the time. It was very fast. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure exactly where the name came from. So I found <laughs> there's a lake in New Hampshire, but they tend to be Pacific Northwest with Intel, so it didn't really fit. Uh, it seems like it's a small neighborhood in Vancouver, Washington, which is across the river from Intel. Or there's a town in northern Washington called Northwood, uh, and I don't know exactly to which this refers. Um, so if you do, if you worked at Intel... And you know, please email us at contact at smugandplay.com and tell us, what is the Northwood Pan Am for named after? Because we would really like to know. We don't really know. But the Northwood the Northwood is important because it is the Pan Am 4 that finally shot past the Athlon XP. And, and when it finally did go into the three gigahertz range, AMD didn't have anything to catch it at the time. So this, this was a, a powerful uh, processor and the, the heart of many builds, uh, including ones we've done together with that. Um, you know, that four, socket 478, uh, 865 PE um, chipset um, makes with AGP 8X makes for a really potent gaming combination yeah. for this era. Yeah. So nobody knew there was a problem with Pinium 4 yet, I guess is what we're saying. Well, uh, things were looking good. Yeah. You know, we're, yeah. we're at 130 nanometers and we're at 3 gigahertz. You know, can we hit 5? Can we hit 6? You know, what's going to happen, Alan? What's going to happen? Well, well, it's funny because uh, the next one is this uh, <laughs> Gallatin Pinium 4 Extreme Edition, um, which is actually one of my favorite processors. For which is reason. hilarious. Uh, also known as the Emergency Edition. Uh, yeah, so, or the extremely hot edition. Yeah, so so AMD released the Athlon 64 with its integrated memory controller, 64-bit architecture. It was very fast, and you know clearly this was the thing gamers wanted. And Intel said, "Okay, we need to answer it with let, let's just pull out all the stops. Let's find the very fastest <laughs> well, processor." Let's we pull can out. Put. Let's pull out some particular stops. Basically, well, let's rebrand something yeah. for a Xeon chip for the server market as an enthusiast product. Yeah. Which is I what mean, AMD yeah. did. I mean, the Athlon 64 is an, is an Opteron, right? For home. So, yeah. Yeah, so the, the big benefit of this chip, it was, you know, sort of like a Northwood in this architecture, but it has two megabytes of extra L3 cache. Um, they also decide to release a new chipset with uh, the higher front side bus. So they kind of just yeah. try to hit it at all angles. And uh, and this actually, if you just, you know, clock for clock, cork for core, whatever, this is the fastest Pinium, you know, for um, the fastest single core Pinium for. Um, is, it, is it also the highest TDP? I think the Smithfield is the highest for TDP. That's what I want to send you, the dual core. Oh, right, uh, of course, the Pinium the D. Core. Um, Prescott days. But going yeah, back sure. to this, again, this is before any of that happened. Heat went exploded. I think this is about 100 watts. Okay. But that's not the maximum for the Pinium 4. Spoilers. So, the Gallatin River. Um, this river, again, I think has a very strong connection to the Pinium 4 Extreme Edition in that it's very scenic. Uh, I actually just went through this on the way to Yellowstone. Um, and there's uh, a lot of fishing. So there's a lot of sporting going on with this I river. See. I see. And this saying. processor is like an extreme gaming processor. So right. I can see how they they come together. Um, 
and I think this is going to be hard for me because it's, it's, it's a really nice river. Uh, and it has fun. low discharge, but it sounds like a really fun river with a it's lot a of activities. River, yeah. It's sort of water sports versus esports here. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't know what to say. I mean, to me, like the extreme edition, the Gallatin based processors were sort of out of reach in terms of cost. I think that actually going to the Gallatin River would cost you a lot less than it would to have. Opinion for Extreme Edition um, processor. These are, I think, are still so they. I think when they debuted, they were nine hundred ninety nine dollars. Is that correct? Yeah. I think that was Intel's nine 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 offering. And honestly, they're still kind of expensive. They're hard to find um, these particular ones. Um, so, I mean, the real question is today: which one are you going to have more fun with, the Gallatin River or Gallatin Pinion Four? It sounds like you're going river. I'm going river. I feel I'm, like the Extreme I'm, Edition I'm, is an incremental improvement over other Pinion 4s that were available that were far more affordable. And, you know, Athlon 64, Athlon 64 is ultimately going to outperform all Pentium 4s. I, I'm just, I'm loyal to the processor. I like how they, you know, basically threw like 100... 20 more million transistors at it and they're like just, 178 just, just million transistors is ridiculous <laughs> for this era it's just it's a it's a cash monster i mean yeah I mean, which is what intel always says i the thing is they put so much cash on there and it's it's just to get a little incremental you know gain it's it's sometimes i feel like it's not worth it but i think that's what that's makes what it great for. okay that's what makes it great Sure, I'll go river. You go, you go chip. We got one more. Okay. This is the last one we're going to cover. This is the, not the last opinion for, but kind of. I like uh, how your picture is of an empty parking lot, basically. <laughs> so the opinion for Prescott. Um, so it's like Twin this Peaks. Was a, this was a process shrink of the opinion for, but they actually also jimmied with the the pipeline again. So. They, they were hoping we're going to go all out. We're going to make this chip. It's going to get five gigahertz. And, you know, again, sales are going to go up and to the right. Everything's going to be amazing. Right. And, uh, you know, AMD will give up and they'll fold and just, you know. Uh, and that's not what happened here, um, which is weird because, you know, they have this new process. But clock for clock, and I looked at this, it's pretty consistent. The Prescott was hotter which is not the direction you expect these things to go. Yes, despite um, despite yeah. going, despite shrinking down the process from 130 to 90 nanometers, Prescott has higher TDP, runs hotter at the same clock speed than Northwood, which is, yeah, not what you would anticipate, but there are reasons. Right. And, well, there are reasons, but, but this created internally at Intel a bunch of finger pointing because the, the chip architecture guys would point at the process guys and say, oh, they messed up, mm -hmm. right? It's not supposed to be hotter. And then the the uh, process guys would point at the chip architecture guys and be like, well, you added like 13 stages of the pipeline and made just like <laughs> this monster that's just like just too big. So, yeah. so all hell broke loose. Uh, and again, even though they released a f uh, you know another Pentium 4 after this, it was the beginning of the end for NetBurst. Uh, and in fact... The Pentium 3 kind of came back as this core CPU, and you know, basically they abandoned this entire project in the course of two years. Um, yeah, and so, and yeah. no one ever came back to this way of thinking either. So, what's interesting to note about Prescott is that this was another case of Intel actually at the time playing catch up uh, with AMD. AMD had leadership when it came to 64-bit execution on the desktop in 64-bit x86. They are the ones that created the AMD 64 ISA, or instruction set architecture, that, that gave us 64-bit computing uh, in the x86 world. Now, because they defined it, Intel had to sort of, uh, and were able to get some support around it, Intel had to follow suit with their compatible EM64T 64-bit ISA, and they baked EM64T support into Prescott and then disabled it, which is really, really <laughs> odd because, I mean, you could say like, well, they were testing it out to see if they could 
build it and, and get correct yields. But that's what engineering samples are for. You don't typically bake such an enormous amount of functionality into consumer mass-produced products and then just disable it. And the, the problem with doing this when they moved to their 90 nanometer process is that their 90 nanometer process was very, very leaky in terms of a leakage current, basically. The reason why it was, it was hotter, partly, is that there was uh, a, a lot of current leaking to ground and that amount of current leaks ground increases with the number of transistors that are on the die and the size of the die and that was ballooned by disabled EM64T support. So there was, it seems like, I don't, I don't understand, like why was the was was 64 bit execution intended for Prescott but then it was broken and then as an an, an emergency thing they just flipped it off yeah I, or, i'm guessing the first stepping didn't work cuz they they later turned it on on all all the prescotts yeah I, they later I, I, turned I just, it on i'm guessing i like how you're you're like leading an investigation you want answers you want, I want answers who, who knew what when? Who knew what when, Odellini? I don't actually know who was... 2004, is Odellini running the show in 2004? It's, it's confusing to me. Um, but let's... What's, one, one thing that should be noted before we talk about Prescott, Oregon, is that people like to say that Northwood was faster than, uh, than Prescott on the same clock. But I, benchmarks show that that's not really the case, or at least... It's not consistently the case. Like Phil's computer lab did gaming benchmarks. Prescott actually isn't slower, consistently slower than Northwood. I don't know. I think it's like, it's sort of a, a balance because they did Jimmy with the pipeline, which I think would have made it slower, but they added more cash. So it, Yeah, it, so it, it ends it, up it just kind of being the same. It, it leads in some, it trails a bit, in other, but it's not really, a, it's not something to get hung up about. Like if you're building a retro PC and you're like, oh no, should I put Northwood or Prescott? Assuming you're trying to build something really cheap, it doesn't really matter. Like who cares? And and people may balk at the, you know, 115, 125 watt TDPs of, of those chips back in the day. But, you know, that's nothing compared to what, you know, a modern, you know, eight core 16 thread processor is, is putting out these days, unless it's, you know, unless it's AMD built it on a seven nanometer node. But like, we've made a lot of really hot processors since, and you can get tower coolers cheap. Uh, so it's, it's less of a big deal. Um, Austin defending the Prescott here. I'm, I'm defending uh, so... the Prescott as if you are trying to build a cheap retro machine and you're like, oh no, I can't. I can't get this particular part. Like, don't agonize. Like, you mm. a modern power supply and a modern um, CPU cooler can handle Prescott, no problemo. Like, don't don't worry. About it. Okay. Yeah. So Prescott, Oregon. So Intel at this time started. I don't know if they ran out of rivers or something, but they started using small towns as names. <laughs> and so this one is like a tiny little mill town on the columbia river um uh and this is like the one picture you get on the internet because it's, it's a small small place i was picturing um, twin peaks and i don't know how you're gonna go but i'm giving it to prescott oregon i think really look at that look i mean you can probably back your boat right in there and and uh, take off i don't know it seems like a lot more fun uh, than uh -huh. finger pointing internally at Intel uh, over who messed up. I'm taking the I'm taking the chip. I mean, it's cool that it's near the Trojan nuclear power plant. Like, it would be kind of fun to to scout that out. But at the same time, I feel like Prescott Prescott obviously had problems, but you know you can get Prescott chips are, are everywhere they rain from the sky they cost nothing on eBay you'll find them by the side of the road and you can build a fantastic retro rig uh, from a Prescott and you shouldn't feel bad about that I mean I, I like that Prescott is the is the cheap alternative to like any chip from this era you know Pentium 3 too much Northwood even too much a Athlon XP for whatever reason Athlon XP you need a monster five volt rail to run a fast one of those. You might not find that on a modern power supply because they're all about 12 volt. You know, it, your, your Prescott board is going to have the ATV, uh, ATX 12 volt connector to be able to support it. Like, I, you know, Prescott is easy to, to do retro builds with. I'm going to choose the chip. I'm sorry. Sorry to people right. who live in Prescott, Oregon. I'm not saying anything bad about the place. 
but I think the the, the processor is overly denigrated. So. so that's the last Intel processor we're covering today. Catch us next time. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about the horses that all of AMD's processors of this era were named after, like the Palomino and the... Do they have Secretariat? Thoroughbred. Um, was Thunderbird a horse? I don't think that's a horse. <laughs> Probably not. Well, that was a Ridges, name. like Raven Ridge. Ridges. We'll picture We're going to talk ridge. about all the lakes. Coffee Lakes, Apollo Lakes. Coff- Whis- uh, there are too many lake. lakes. Whiskey Lake. Yeah. That sounds... Which I mean, I know which lakes sound like the most fun. Whiskey Lake sounds good. About now. I can go for a Whiskey Lake. Um, that doesn't mean that they're very good processors, but... No, um, we always forget to say, uh, if you enjoyed this video, or even if you didn't, please like and subscribe. Um, we're at like 34 subscribers right now, which is not a phenomenal number. It's probably based on some of the content that we're doing, if I had to guess. But we're going to continue to uh, defy the algorithm and make weird things. Um, and if you're into that, please uh, like and subscribe to us here. Follow us at Smug in Play uh, on Twitter and on Instagram. 